everyone. So today we're going to look at topography associated with inclined strata. You can find this work on page 136 to 140 in your textbooks. And the first thing we're going to look at is just a bit of terminology. Um, our inclined strata just simply means that our stratigraphic layers are now tilted at a certain angle. In other words, it's inclined. In this specific picture, I've got alternating inclined stratigraphic layers of shale and sandstone. Now, the shale is less weather resistant. In other words, it weathers more easily, as you can see from these funny dips over here, and they form a dip slope. The sandstone, however, is more weather resistant, so it's more difficult to break down. And it'll form a steeper slope, which is known as the scarp slope. Now, the, gentle, uh, the gently dipping dip slope formed by your easily weatherable materials and your steep scarp slope together form what is known as a homoclinal ridge. What would this look like on your topographic map? Well, just simply put, because your scarp slope has a very steep angle, if we refer back to this picture, scarp slope, very steep, your contour lines will be very closely spaced. They'll be close to each other to indicate a steep slope. The dip slope, on the other hand, is very gently dipping. So my contour lines will be quite far apart. So this is my dip slope. You got it? Not difficult, right? And this is what a nice 3D cross section of a scarf and dip slope would look like. So on the front side, or of a homoclinal ridge, actually. So on the front side, we've got our scarf slope, very steep, made from competent or weather resistant rocks. On top, we've got our dip slope, and that's just because my incompetent or easily weatherable rocks were on top and they've been weathered away. This forms a dip slope. What we're going to look at now is called scarp recession and homoclinal shifting. Now, the idea behind scarp rec recession is just simply that my scarp slope moves backwards without changing its angle. So the angle of my scarp will remain the same or very close to the same, and it will be quite steep throughout. So the first step. The first thing that happens is we've got what we call sheet, wash, uh, sheet washing or mass wasting taking place. So that's when rainwater seeps in through the cracks and actually starts eroding the front portion of the scarp slope. Now as this part weathers and erodes, it gets broken down and is deposited at the foot of the hill. This deposited material over here is now known as talus. This is quite an important term. They like asking that in your final exams. Just a side note on talus. Talus is usually very mineral rich. That's why you have got quite dense vegetation at the foot of a hill. So it's got thick soils. It's mineral rich. It retains water really well. So you'll have a lot of plants growing over there. Now, as time goes by, my scarp or my scarp slope just keeps receding. It just keeps moving backwards. Again, what is important is for you to remember that the angle does not change. It stays the same steepness or very close to the same steepness. The only thing that changes is that it moves backwards in the direction of the dip slope. So that's what they mean by it moves in the direction of the dip slope. So let's just start again. So this was the first portion of the scarp slope. It eroded, it moved or receded backwards, and it's moving in the direction of the dip slope. So the next line will be towards the dip slope. So it recedes even further and so on and so forth. I hope that makes sense. It's not very complicated. Okay, now what do we form in a process such as this? The first thing we're going to look at is a cuesta. Now cuesta, has got the exact same setting. I've got inclined strat uh, stratigraphic layers. We've got a resistant, a weather resistant stratigraphic layer over here. This could be anything from basalt to quartzite. Um, it's just my more weather resistant layer. It forms a very steep scarp slope and it forms a dip slope, 
what I do want you to note in this picture is that this line over here is an imaginary line. I'm drawing a horizontal imaginary line and I'm measuring the angle between my resistant layer and the horizontal line. Now, if that angle is between 10 and 25 degrees, I've got a cuesta. As soon as that angle is between 25 and 45 degrees, I've now got a homoclinal ridge. So the only difference between a cuesta and a homoclinal ridge is the angle. So cuesta is 10 to 25 degrees, homoclinal ridge is 25 to 45 degrees, and the very last one is when it exceeds the 45 degrees, and we call that a hog's back. Fun term. I like that term. I don't know why. It's fun to say. Hog's back. Okay, so when a horizontal imaginary line is drawn with my resistant layer and that angle is more than 45 degrees, I've got a hog's back. So let's look at this. How do we actually form cuestas? Now in the previous chapter, we considered the fact that all sedimentary layers or all stratigraphic layers are deposited horizontally. In other words, they're stacked layer upon layer upon layer, but in a straight horizontal fashion. Now during tectonic movement or tectonic forces, these layers are compressed. In other words, they're pressed together. Now, if you press a piece of paper towards each other or press the sides towards each other, you end up folding the paper. So the same thing happens with my stratigraphic layers. They get folded. So this is a piece of earth that once was horizontal, but due to tectonic forces compressing it, it has now formed different folds. And these folds have different names. So the first part of the fold, which forms almost an A, is called an anticline. An anticline is almost always followed by a syncline. So just think of the bottom of an S, a syncline, and that's followed by an anticline. And this pattern can just continue repeating itself. Okay, so we've got an anticline, a syncline, and an anticline. But I still don't have the cuesta quite yet. So the next thing that happens is just simple erosion on top of this mountain range, if I can call it that. So after erosion has taken place, in the case of the syncline, I form what is known as a cuesta basin. So let's just quickly go back. Here's my syncline here. And due to erosion that has taken place and removed this whole top part over here, I now form a cuesta basin. So how is a cuesta basin formed? Simply, horizontal layers have been compressed by tectonic forces and the top part of these uh, layers or folds now have been eroded. And here I have a cuesta basin at the syncline part of the folded strata. What do you think we would call the anticline part? Not very creative, but easy to remember. At the anticline part, I now form a dome, like a dome-shaped whatever. So at the anticline, I form a dome. There you have it. That's how we form a cuesta dome and a cuesta basin. So we've got original horizontal stratigraphic layers, which have been compressed by tectonic forces. This compression causes the formation of anticlines and synclines, and due to erosion, we now form cuesta basins at the syncline portion and cuesta domes at the anticline portion of the folded strata. Your homework would be to copy these sketches that I have in this presentation into your book and label them. Make sure you understand the differences between them, the processes of how they formed, etc. On top of that, please complete activities six and seven and summarize page 140 and complete activity eight, which is also on page 140. Now, just quickly, page 140 just deals with how people can actually use the different um, incline strata that we've looked at just now. Let's just take it one back to a cuesta basin. If we think about a cuesta basin, the shale layer over here is less weather resist. I mean, is more weather resistant. That's why it forms like a bit of a ditch and it's quite even. 
On top of that, shale likes retaining water. So I've got a big surface area over here. I'll have a lot of soil on top of it because it weathers very easily and it retains water. Shale, furthermore, is quite soil, is quite mineral rich. So this is an ideal place to have a farm, perfect place to have a farm. The scarp slope, on the other hand, is not good for farming at all. It'll have solid rock, you won't have any soil coverage, um, it won't retain water, etc. But my scarp slopes are good for recreational activities such as mountain climbing or abseiling, etc. If we look at a Cuesta Dome, this is where abseiling and rock climbing is best because now I can actually climb on the inside. I've got a bigger exposed area and it's fun to climb this side for those of you who are quite adventurous. If we look at our more resistant shale layers over here, we've got very little exposed surface. So this would not be that ideal for farming. We don't have a lot of space, but this is a good recreational site. I hope that makes sense. So you can just read through the rest of the information and complete activity eight. Thank you.